Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Hart Beatty. I'd like to welcome you all to our next uh, lecture series for the APDR National Virtual Noon Conference. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, I chair the APDR Education Committee and I'm the Neuroradiology Fellowship Director at Boston Medical Center. And it is a great pleasure to have an, another amazing group of speakers today uh, lecturing. Uh, again, I'd like to go over just a couple housekeeping items. Um, the webinar is being recorded and uh, the webinars are being hosted on the APDR YouTube channel. It takes about a one week turnaround for us to post those. So we appreciate your patience on that. Uh, secondly, the written questions and comments are being recorded as well as the webinar. Um, the attendees are muted uh, just for uh, optimal quality, as you can see. And if you do have questions, we uh, suggest that you use the question and answer tool uh, in the Zoom platform. And uh, our speakers will try to get to answering those questions um, after, their, after their talks. So I'd like to introduce uh, both speakers. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Carolyn de Benedictes from the University of Massachusetts. Uh, she's also the program director there. And following Dr. de Benedictes, we'll have Dr. Johnson, Karen Johnson from Duke University, also the radiology residency program director there. We're so honored to have uh, both people uh, join us today. So without further ado, I will stop sharing my screen and we'll have Dr. de Benedictes take over. All right, so I think everyone should be able to see my screen now, God willing. Uh, I'm Cheryl Benedictus, and as, as uh, Harp said, I'm from the University of Massachusetts, and today I'm going to talk to you about breast implants and breast imaging. So, um, as you guys know, there's two main types of implants. There is silicone and saline implants, um, and silicone can be dual lumen or single lumen, but for the purpose of today's talk, we're really going to simplify it down to just saline and silicone implants. So saline implants um, have a silicone polymer um, around, the edge, around the edge of the implant, and when they put them in surgically, they put them in with no saline in them. So initially, they put these, uh, fold these silicone um, polymer shells up and insert them into either under the pectoralis muscle or in front of the pectoralis muscle. And on it, there's a valve. And attached to that valve is tubing. They then subsequently, once these in silicone polymer capsules are in, they then in insert saline into the polymer capsule to get the desired size. And that, that valve that you can see right here that almost looks like a bullseye or a target, that is really important because that's one of the key features on imaging to let you differentiate between silicone and saline. So here is a silicone implant on imaging, a saline, I apologize, saline implant on imaging. As you can see, we can see that valve very clearly and they're, the implants are not, not super, super dense. So you can kind of, they're kind of radiolucent and you can see through them. You'll see a lot of these radial folds as well. Um, and you can see how the polymer capsule is a touch bit more dense on mammography. But the important thing is to always look for these valves. On ultrasound, you can see the silicone polymer here, the capsule, and then you can see the simple clear fluid inside of the saline implant. On MRI, these are T2 bright because they're simple fluid internally. You can see the T1 dark silicone polymer capsule. And again, you can see the valve illustrated by the arrow here. So those are the important features so that you can distinguish um, that it's a saline implant. Silicone implants, on the other hand, come pre-filled and they have the silicone polymer capsule like we talked about the same one as the, as the saline, except inside they have a silicone, a gel-like silicone um, mixture in, in lieu of saline. And these will go in filled. So these have more of a lenticular shape, they look like a lens, um, and these go in filled. So they are not filled once they're in, so there's no valve since they're pre-filled. And on imaging, we can see that they're much denser than the saline implants on mammography. We can see some of those radial folds, but they're not as easy to see on mammography due to the density, and we do not see a valve. On MR, this is a silicone bright Im image, 
and we can see the T1 dark um, silicone polymer capsule as well as the silicone um, polymer radial folds. And we can see that the silicone gel inside is, is, is bright on silicone um, bright images. So now let's talk about the location and placement of these implants during surgery. There's two placements. One is subglandular and one is retropectoral. So just to go over the anatomy of the breast, so we have the breast tissue here, uh, the glandular tissue and fat, and then we have the pectoralis muscle posterior to it. For subglandular implants, they put the implant anterior to the pectoralis muscle and posterior to the glandular tissue. For retropectoral implants or subpectoral implants, they put it below the pectoralis muscle. Now, the benefit of the, of the retropectoral implant is that we can more easily displace the tissue from the implant um, for mammography. So here is how we tell if it's a retropectoral implant on mammography. So if you look, you will get a obtuse angle of the pectoralis muscle with the silicone implant, with the implant in general, silicone or saline, um, on the MLO view. And it's really important to look for that obtuse angle. That's how you're going to be able to tell if this is prepectoral or retropectoral. If there's an obtuse angle, like we see here, it is retropectoral. You on the CC sometimes can see the pectoralis muscle. Here you can, um, anterior to the implant. Sometimes when the pectoralis muscle is stretched really thin by a large implant, it can be hard to see the pectoralis muscle on the CC view. So that's why you always wanna make sure you're making that determination mainly off of the MLO view. For a subglandular implant or a prepectoral implant, we see an acute angle of the pectoralis muscle with the implant. So if you look here, we see the pectoralis muscle here and there's an acute angle, much different from that obtuse angle. And then it's hard to even see the pectoralis muscle on the CC because the implant is in front of it. Here on this image, you can see a little of it laterally, but again, it's anterior to it, so you cannot see it at all on the CC view. So again, the main determinant for placement is looking at the angle of the pectoralis muscle on the MLO view. So, Today, time allowing, we're going to talk about postoperative changes, capsular contraction, rupture, silicone, and different types of silicone or other injections, and implant-associated tumors. I'm not sure we'll get to implant-associated tumors in the 30 minutes, but I'll try my best. So implant imaging. The main modalities that we Im image implants are, are mammography, ultrasound, and MRI. On mammography, we do two different sets of views when patients have implants. We do implant in place views and implant displaced views. So on the implant in place views, you can see the implant and the glandular tissue. And these are the, these are the views that you want to determine what type of implant it is and what the location of the implant is. So on the implant in place views, you want to determine the type of implant, which in this case is very dense. I don't see a valve, so that is a silicone implant. On the and on the MLO view, we can see that there is an obtuse angle between the pectoralis muscle, as I'm outlining with my mouse, and the implant. So thus, this is a retropectoral placement. So it is a retropectoral silicone implant. So it's very important to window and level these, especially when they're saline implants, so that you can make sure you can see behind the saline to see if there's any um, masses or anything hiding, especially on prepectoral implants. Um, but you can also look at the overall axilla, the tissue, the skin, the nipple on the implant in place views. Now, on the implant displaced views, this is where the technologist displaces the implant posteriorly so that they pull as much tissue anteriorly away from the implant. Now, this is the views that you're going to examine the tissue most closely. So here you can see we see a lot of tissue compared to the other views, and we can see that tissue is spread out better so that we can see if there's any masses, calcifications, or other abnormalities here. So these are the implant displaced views. So for a implant mammogram, there's eight views total, unlike the four standard views of a regular screening mammogram. So next we'll talk about postoperative complications. So the complications and what you'll be looking for with different types with implants when you're imaging them depend on how recent the implant was put in place. So postoperative, immediate postoperative complications are usually hematomas and infections. And both of these will present as fluid collections. So the best way to evaluate these are with ultrasound. 
And so here we can see a perioperative fluid, a peri implant fluid collection. Um, and you can see peri implant fluid collections acutely, and you can see them uh, chronically. For here, you can see on ultrasound, this is the skin here. We have the implant here, and this is the fluid in the implant. But then we see um, adjacent to the implant this other fluid collection. If it's a completely simple fluid collection, it could just be a postoperative seroma. If it seems more complex, like this one that has some debris, it could be a hematoma or infection. And the only way to know if it's a hematoma versus an infection when it's a complex, complicated collection is you're going to have to aspirate it um, and send it for culture. Um, I got a comment that people can't hear well. I'm hoping now people can hear well. I'm holding my speaker closer to me. So a later complication of implants is capsular contraction. And this is abnormal constriction of the fibrous capsule that surrounds the pressed implant. It can occur anytime after surgery and most commonly occurs in the first few months, whereas hematomas and infection commonly occur within the first few weeks or days after after implants are placed. It's most commonly seen in subglandular implants, thus why a lot of implants are now done retropectorally, and it's a clinical diagnosis. However, imaging can suggest it. So when we see a change in the implant or thickening of the fibrous capsule, or we see peri-implant calcifications, these on imaging can suggest capsular contraction, but it's really important that we just say, the implant shape has changed, we see thickening of the fibrous capsule, or we see peri-implant calcification. And if the qu clinical question was, is there cap evidence of capsular contraction, we can say in the appropriately clinical setting, these are suggestive of capsular contraction. But we cannot actually diagnose it. The physician needs to do that, the clinical physician, by saying that there is no movement of the capsule plus these imaging findings. So this is an example of capsular contraction. Notice these are pre-pectoral, these are saline implants, even though it's hard to tell. And the reason it's hard to tell is because there's these dense calcifications. There's these plaque-like dense calcifications all along the capsule. And this patient had capsular contraction. Again, they're pre-pectoral, so this is more likely in pre-pectoral implants. Implant rupture. So this is mainly the reason we see implants um, on imaging is people outside of just on a screening mammogram, physicians or patients are, are concerned about implant rupture. The actual incidence of implant rupture is unknown. However, the risk of rupture is directly related to the age of the implant. So the older the implant, the increased risk of rupture. The median lifespan of an implant is about 10.8 years, and a lot of implants are replaced after, are recommended to be replaced after 10 years due to this risk. However, a lot of people don't replace them, and so we start to see implant rupture um, at a greater rate over 10-year-old implants. And the risk is inversely related to the thickness of the elastopolymer shell. So the thicker the polymer used for the implant, the less likely there is a risk of rupture. So most silicone implant ruptures are intracapsular, and we'll talk about what that is in a bit. And silicone implants, um, we image when there's rupture. Saline implants, we do not image when there's rupture because that is a clinical diagnosis. This, the implant will rupture and the fluid will be absorbed into the body. And thus, we will be able to see the decrease in size of the, of the, breast, of the breast clinically. So silicone implants can have an intra or extra capsular rupture and it depends on the location of the rupture with respect to the fibrous capsule. As I said before, when saline develops a rupture, the, it rapidly decompresses and the, it's a clinical diagnosis by decrease in size and no imaging is needed. So here are the types of rupture. There are two types of capsules around in silicone implants. There's the silicone polymer capsule and then there's the fibrous capsule. And the fibrous capsule is a reaction by the body that forms around the implant with age. And so you'll get this, the body creates this fibrous capsule, and then that is on top of the silicone polymer capsule. So when only the silicone polymer capsule tears, and the silicone that is free from the silicone polymer capsule is still maintained within the fibrous capsule, this is an intracapsular rupture. However, when the fibrous capsule ruptures too, and the silicone makes it outside of the silicone polymer and the fibrous capsule, that is an 
extra capsular rupture. So it's always important to be very specific in your reports about if it's an intra or an extra capsular rupture. You cannot have an extra capsular rupture without an intra capsular rupture, but you can have an intra capsular rupture without an extra capsular rupture. So it's important to remember that. So implant rupture on mammography. Intercapsular rupture can be difficult to detect on mammography, but it can be seen with a contour bulge. So if for years you saw perfectly oval silicone implants on your mammogram, and now today there's a bulge out of the top, that is very concerning for an intercapsular rupture. Signs of extracapsular rupture are easier to see. You'll see radio-opaque silicone extending away from the implant and into the parenchyma. We can even see radio-opaque lymph nodes, which are an example of that silicone being um, uptake by the, by the lymph nodes. And this is, as I said, very easily detected on mammography compared to intracapsular rupture. So this is an example of extracapsular rupture. You can see that the dense, the, the dense silicone that is there. Now this patient had a history of silicone implant rupture. They currently had their silicone implants replaced with saline implants. So you can see the valve here. But this is a great example of silicone outside of an implant. And, if, and earlier, there was a silicone implant in place here. And now there's the saline one. But this is all extracapsular silicone from a previous silicone implant. Again, this is another example of extracapsular rupture on mammography, except there, the ruptured silicone implant is still in place, and we can see the hyperdense silicone superiorly. This is an example of um, a saline implant rupture. So what happens is if the saline implant ruptures and they do not remove the silicone polymer shell, you see a shrunken and calcified silicone polymer shell, as you can see here. This is another example of saline implant rupture. So you can see that in 2016, both of the saline implants were round um, and filled. And then in 2018, you can see that the left silicone implant polymer is now decompressed and folded up. And this is due to silicone implant rupture. So implant rupture on ultrasound, um, it's not very sensitive and specific for, for rupture, so we don't use it much. Some signs that we can see of intracapsular rupture um, are a step ladder sign, uh, low level echoes in the central aspect of the implant, but use this with caution. It's not very specific. Um, pockets of silicone uh, between the implant shell and the fibrous capsule, which will show up as dirty shadowing. Extracapsular rupture signs, we will see free silicone in the parenchyma or in the lymph nodes, which will show dirty shadowing. So here are some signs of intracapsular rupture. We see the step ladder sign where we see all these. So this is the silicone polymer. And here we can see all these silicone polymers coming down. It looks like ladders, um, uh, steps on a ladder. This is that very not specific low level internal echoes we can see. You would expect the saline implant to be clear. Um, and this one is not. However, this would be a very early sign as this would completely decompress. And then here we can see the fibrous capsule and the silicone polymer capsule and the asterisk is marking um, silicone in between those two. And this is a sign of um, intracapsular rupture. Um, extracapsular rupture, um, this is a great one where we can actually see discontinuity of the silicone polymer implant and the very dense silicone extending outside of the both the fibrous and the uh, polymer shell. So this is the polymer shell. We can see a discontinuity here and silicone coming out. This is that snowstorm effect that we see. So when the silicone is extra capsular, we can see part of the capsular over here. Um, if you look here, that double capsule polymer shell here, when it comes out, it shows this snowstorm effect where you cannot see posteriorly because of the density of it. This is a, another thing you can see within the snowstorm effect. You can see globules of silicone in it as well. It looks like little dots. Implant rupture on MRI. MRI is the most specific imaging modality for implant rupture, and it's the preferred method. There are multiple signs of intercapsular rupture that you can see on 
on MR imaging, there's the Linguini sign, the teardrop sign, the keyhole sign, and the subcapsular line sign. Again, we only do MRI for silicone implant rupture, not saline, as saline is a clinical diagnosis. Signs of extracapsular rupture on MRI, we see free silicone separate from the implant. We see ISO to low signal intensity on the T1 fat sat images, and we can see high signal intensity on the water suppressed T2 images, all external to the capsules. So on what, what, what imaging do we use on MRI to evaluate? Well, we use T1 imaging to see the fibrous capsule, and the fibrous capsule is dark, on t and dark and if not black on T1 imaging. So on your T1 images, you want to be evaluating your fibrous capsule for any breaks or discontinuities. On T2 fat set and T2 non -fat, fat set, you're looking at the overall picture of the implant. And for on the silicone only or silicone bright sequences and the silicone suppressed silicone black sequences, you're evaluating for extracapsular silicone, as well as looking at um, the silicone polymer capsule to see if there is a uh, rupture, intercapsular rupture. It's important to remember that the silicone polymer implant capsule is dark, but not as dark as the fibrous capsule. The fibrous capsule is essentially black, whereas the silicone polymer capsule is a, a dark gray. And I'll show you examples of that. So this is an example of extracapsular rupture on MRI. And here we can see the grayish silicone polymer capsule, which is, is showing us a linguini sign, which is layering, string-like layering of the polymer capsule within the posterior implant. And then we can see all this extracapsular silicone here outside of the T2 dark, or T1 dark, I apologize, T1 dark, and essentially black fibrous capsule. So this is the black fibrous capsule here. And here we can see posterior immediately some discontinuity in that fibrous capsule and that the silicone uh, gel has leaked out. So it's an intra and extracapsular rupture. This is another example of extracapsular rupture on MRI. We can see silicone external to the um, fibrous capsule here. This is the fibrous capsule right here. We can see one of the uh, linguini signs of the silicone polymer capsule. And then on the silicone bright image, we can see a keyhole sign where we see silicone, bright silicone on both sides of the dark gray silicone polymer capsule. And then we also see we also see sil bright silicone external to the T1 dark um, fibrous capsule, and we can see discontinuity anteriorly there. So this is an example of a subcapsular line sign for intercapsular rupture, where we see a, the silicone polymer um, line with then bright silicone between it and the dark fibrous capsule. And this is the teardrop sign, and this is where we see bright silicone within a radial fold. So a normal radial fold should um, the two T2 dark, uh, sorry, the two dark lines should be directly on top of each other with no bright intervening silicone. A teardrop sign shows silicone in that, uh, in between that, and that is a sign of extra extra capsular silicone for um, the polymer capsule. We also have the keyhole or new sign like we saw before here, where you can see the dark fibrous capsule here, which appears to be intact. But on the other side of the gray silicone polymer capsule, we see silicone. And this is the keyhole or new sign. And all of these are signs of intercapsular rupture. These are great examples of the Linguini sign. Here we see lots of string-like uh, uh, string, uh, string -like dark uh, polymer capsule within the silicone bright sequence here. And then here, immediately, we see a little bit of extracapsular silicone as well. So this is an intra and extracapsular rupture. On the first image, we can only tell it's an intracapsular rupture because of the Linguini sign. On the second image, we can tell that there is extracapsular silicone, so there's an intra and extracapsular rupture. This is sagittal MR of um, silicone implant rupture. Here we can see. Um, extracapsular silicone on the silicone bright sequence. We can see kind of a new uh, or keyhole sign here, probably linguini sign here. And again, um, some of some of the linguinis, uh, some linguini sign on the left breast, but no extracapsular silicone. So on the right, we have a intra and extracapsular rupture and on the left, just an intracapsular rupture. 
This is a mammogram um, to show you um, an example of it on all modalities. So on the right side, we, um, what, we see what appears to be an intact implant, but on the left side, we see extracapsular silicone seen on these implant displaced views here. We then did an ultrasound on the right side and in the axilla, we could see dirty shadowing from, um, this is a lymph node, but this lymph node has taken up silicone, so we see dirty shadowing. And then on the MRI, we have confirmed an intra and extra capsular rupture on the right side, and we noted an intra and extra capsular rupture that was not seen on mammography on the um, left side. So we can see that here with silicone posteriorly and our keyhole, um, our keyhole and teardrop signs. And then on more images of the MR, we can actually see the on the silicone bright sequences, silicone within the uh, lymph nodes, in the internal mammary nodes, as well as the axillary. And we can also see a little silicone posterior, free silicone posterior on the left. This is a dense lymph node that we noted. This patient had had a ruptured silicone implant removed, and we can see the remnants of the silicone here, but that lymph node was new, larger, and dense. So we wanted to make sure it wasn't a metastatic lymph node. Instead, it's a silicone-containing lymph node. We can see the thin normal cortex um, on ultrasound with the dirty shadowing or the snowstorm shadowing um, within the center of the lymph node. So this is a silicone-containing uh, node. So, Lastly, uh, it looks like we'll only have time to go through injected substances. So there's multiple types of injected substances. Silicone is the most commonly still seen. We're also seeing increase in fat injections due to fat grafting, mostly in patients who have had breast conservation therapy. And I'll show you an example of a paraffin injection, which is very old, and I had to borrow it from someone because we really don't see it anymore. So liquid silicone injections were used from the 1940s until it was banned in the 1970s. It's where they directly inject using needles silicone directly into the breast tissue. And it'll appear as multiple well-defined rounded peripherally calcified masses. Um, in addition to mammography, we actually recommend screening MRI in these people because their mammograms are almost essentially useless because of these dense masses in the breast. Multiple complications can be caused by these injections outside of just masking breast cancer. There can be skin flopping, silicone migration, lymphadenopathy, infection, granuloma formation, and silicone embolism. This is what a mammogram looks like um, of someone who has had silicone injections. And as you can see, it would be nearly impossible to detect um, a breast cancer within the areas of silicone injection. So this is really scary for a breast imager to see because we don't know what we're missing here. And these are multiple areas of fat necrosis and silicone granulomas. Analogous fat implantation, um, this harvests the fat from the patient um, and then re-injects it into the breast as to avoid hypersensitivity reactions. It appears as clear lucent masses throughout the breast and can cause fat necrosis and calcification, so it can look like multiple oil cysts as well. This is an example of that. We can see these multiple lucent masses from fat injection, and this was done for augmentation without um, implant, uh, oh, I'm sorry, without breast conservation therapy. And when you look in, you actually see dirty shadowing from the fat. Eventually, they'll look like um, fat uh, oil cysts on ultrasound. Paraffin injections, these were used in the 1900s, and it appears as well circumscribed non-calcified masses. Again, snowstorm appearance on ultrasound and can be associated with inflammatory reactions. Very rare to see these anymore, but this is what they would look like. As you can see, this is a really old mammogram. It looks like multiple masses of varying density. So that's it. Um, again, there's multiple um, implant-associated tumors that we're not going to have time to go over, but helpful for you to read up on about silicone granulomas. Again, breast cancer can occur in association with implants. There's also implant-associated mesenchymal tumors and anaplastic large T-cell lymphoma, for which a recent implant was recalled because there was an increased incidence of it. Um, sorry we ran out of time, but thank you for attending my talk. And now I would like to turn it over to um, Dr. Johnson. All right, for the next 30 minutes, we are going to talk about breast ultrasound um, and how to use it appropriately. So for those of you that um, have done breast ultrasound, which I'm assuming is all of you, or at least most of you, you know that lesions can have a very wide variety of appearances on breast ultrasound. So it behooves you to learn the BIRADS language of breast ultrasound in order to describe these masses and therefore lead you to the appropriate management algorithm. 
Um, so we're going to first review the BIRADS edition um, for BIRADS terminology as it pertains to breast ultrasound. We'll go through some specific management algorithms regarding breast ultrasound, and then we'll end with some clinical uses of breast ultrasound. So let's just start by talking about what is BIRADS. BIRADS, of course, stands for the breast imaging. Um, <laughs> I just blanked on what BIRADS stands for. <laughs> Okay, but it is used to um, have a consistent universal terminology of language to describe lesions. And this reduces our ambiguity as radiologists when we're describing lesions. And it also helps us lead to the appropriate interpretation and management. Um, again, I behoove you, I encourage you to learn BIRADS and use it appropriately. It will help you. Okay, so why, why should you care and why should you use BIRADS? Well, as you know, many specialties perform ultrasound these days. It's not just radiologists. The ED has ultrasounds, of course. OB-GYNs have ultrasounds in their office. So you have to sort of prove your worth these days as radiologists when you're interpreting ultrasound and show that you can bring value over what they can do. It used to be that if you came to radiology, you got the fancy high-end equipment, and that's what sort of separated us from others. But that's not the case anymore. Even these small handheld devices can produce pretty good images. So again, we need to be able to add value to our patients and for the referring docs um, in terms of our interpretive skills. So of course, breast ultrasound can characterize lesions as either solid or cystic, but we can go beyond that. And we can certainly have some sort of level of suspicion as it is what we're looking at. And it can also help us define extent of disease in women with known malignancies. So at its minimum, BIRADS will help you describe what you see, right? That's what it's used for. But beyond that, it helps you to assess the level of suspicion. So as you become familiar with the words and you use them appropriately, you will see that each of these words has a positive and negative predictive value associated with them and lead you to a level of suspicion that will help you determine what you can ignore, follow, and what you absolutely need to biopsy. This, of course, will hopefully help you advise your patients and your referring clinicians appropriately. And after it's all said and done, if you do recommend a biopsy, um, your language will help you with concordance, essentially. If you are using a string of very suspicious words to describe a mass, and then you get back on your core biopsy benign breast tissue, something's not right, and that would be discordant, and you should probably recommend surgical excision. So again, I highly recommend you becoming familiar with the BIRADS terminology and using it. It is very, very helpful. All right, so for those of you that have picked up a BIRADS manual recently, you know that it's big. It's mostly pictures, but it's also a lot of words. Um, and in the world of breast ultrasound, BIRADS, these are the different categories. And we're gonna go through each of these categories and describe them. We're gonna start with tissue composition. Tissue composition refers to the um, variation of fat and fibroglandular tissue within the breast. It's sort of synonymous with breast density on mammography. Um, and the more um, fat and fibroglandular tissue that is admixing within the breast, the more complicated the breast can become. Um, it feels as if the tissue composition affects our sensitivity as radiologists in determining uh, breast lesions on ultrasound, but there's no real data to support that. But certainly, anecdotally, it feels that way. And I'll show you what I mean. So when it comes to tissue composition, you can have a homogeneous background architecture or a heterogeneous background architecture. If it's a homogeneous background architecture, it can be predominantly fatty, like this, like both of these uh, images here. So you can see that both images here are just smooth fab, fat lobules. Um, and oftentimes when you're scanning a patient like this and she's looking at the screen with you, she'll say that it just looks like waves in an ocean. And the idea here is that it's a very fatty background tissue. And so picking out what's not fat and what's different is sort of simple. Um, this is also a homogeneous background architecture, but this is a very fibroglandular background architecture. It's very white, right? Um, and again, although it's subtle, you can see that there's something there that doesn't belong. And again, the more homogeneous the background architecture is, it seems as if our sensitivity is better at detecting what's not there. Compare that to these two women who have a very heterogeneous uh, tissue composition. So they have multiple interfaces of hyper and hypoechoic foci and multiple areas of shadowing. 
This can be focal or it can be diffuse. Certainly if it's diffuse, it's more helpful because when it's focal, it can look like it's a lesion that you need to biopsy. So sometimes it is helpful to scan other parts of the breast to determine if this is, quote, just how she's made. Sometimes it's helpful to scan the contralateral breast to understand if her tissue composition is heterogeneous. Um, you typically see this more commonly in younger breast tissue and in those women who are heterogeneously dense on mammography. Again, it feels as if we have a lower sensitivity in detecting breast malignancy in these women, but that data, um, it does not necessarily exist to back that up. All right, we're gonna move on to masses. Now masses, this is the meat of ultrasound virads, right? In terms of breast imaging. Um, the most common thing we evaluate with breast imaging, I'm sorry, with ultrasound and breast imaging are masses. So a mass is defined as a 3D space occupying lesion that should be seen in two different planes. And you'll notice that I have that in all caps, right? It is very easy to make a normal structure look very abnormal in one plane. And that's why you need to turn on it in an orthogonal view. And if it still looks suspicious, then you likely have yourself a real lesion that probably needs biopsy. But this is very important to be able to identify something in two orthogonal views. All right, once you have determined that you indeed have a mass on breast ultrasound, um, you're going to describe it with Virad's terminology. And if you can describe the shape, the orientation, and the margin appropriately, then again, you are well on your way to doing right by your patient. All right, so this is the money slide. If you know these words and how to use them appropriately, you will do yourself and your patients a huge favor, okay? So let's start off by talking about mass shape. You have three choices, pretty simple. You can describe a mass as either oval, round, or irregular. Pretty straightforward stuff, right? An oval mass is egg-shaped, right? And um, it is typically parallel, which we'll talk about in a moment. And an oval shape is considered a reassuring feature. Round is round, right? It's spherical, it's a ball. And we'll talk about this later too, but round is generally considered a suspicious shape. And then everything else, if it's not oval or round, is considered irregular. And irregular always is considered a suspicious shape. Next, we're gonna talk about mass orientation. And this is a very important feature. Um, we describe mass orientation as parallel or not parallel, and this is relative to the skin, okay? Again, very important feature to assess when you're looking at a mass on ultrasound. If you um, describe it as parallel, that means that its long axis is parallel to the skin surface. We also call this sometimes wider than tall. And these types of masses are typically benign, not always. You have to assess other features as well, like the mass margin and the mass shape. Um, but if they are wider than tall, then it typically means that they are you know, playing nice with the fascial planes. They're growing in the same direction as the fascial planes, which is typically what benign things do. So parallel is a reassuring feature. That being said, not all parallel masses are in fact benign. And as I alluded to earlier, you're gonna to have to look at other features as well. So the mass that just appeared on your screen at the top has irregular borders to it. And that is very important. And that's what led to the biopsy of this mass to prove that it was in fact invasive ductal carcinoma, even though it's parallel. Okay, not parallel, anti-parallel, taller than wide. All of those descriptors are the same. So these are masses in which the long, long axis is perpendicular to the skin. This is a suspicious feature. So this mass is not respecting fascial planes and kind of growing against them. And that is something that malignancy does much more commonly than benign masses. So again, if you have a mass that is taller than wide or anti-parallel, almost certainly you should be biopsying it. Okay, next we're gonna talk about mass margin. Mass margin is exceedingly, exceedingly, exceedingly important to assess. Um, mass margin has the highest positive and negative predictive value of any feature when you're looking at a mass. So it's important to get this right. All right, if you wanna keep it simple, you can certainly just describe the mass margin as either circumscribed or not circumscribed. If you wanna get a little bit more specific, once you've determined it to be not circumscribed, you can describe it as distinct, microlabulated, angular, or spiculated. 
most circumscribed masses are benign and many not circumscribed masses are malignant. So this is a very important feature to assess and interrogate very, very um, judiciously. All right, so these are both masses with nice circumscribed margins, right? You can clearly see where the mass stops and where the surrounding breast tissue begins. These are both benign. This mass is microlobulated, short undulating um, borders, scalloped. This is invasive ductal carcinoma. This is an indistinct mass. The, those margins are kind of fuzzy. Um, that is suspicious and that was an invasive ductal carcinoma. Here's another one. These are angular margins. Whenever you see little tails um, that are um, producing acute margins, that is a suspicious feature. And then finally, our old friend speculated. Everybody, probably knows speculated margins and knows that if you are describing a mass, whether it's on mammography, ultrasound, or MRI that with speculated margins, if it hasn't been biopsied already, then it probably should be. All right, and that's it for masses, to be honest with you. We'll talk a little bit about echo pattern and posterior acoustic features, but again, if you can accurately describe the shape, orientation, and margin, you are well on your way, again, to doing right by your patients. Okay, one thing I do wanna bring up that is not a major feature, quote unquote, any longer in the BIRADS lexicon is lesion boundary, and specifically this idea of an echogenic halo. Sometimes we talk about masses having an echogenic rind, the same thing, echogenic halo and echogenic rind. So you'll see both of these masses right around it, those are both hypoechoic masses with an echogenic rind. If you see that, your differential diagnosis is pretty short. Most masses that have an echogenic rind are either breast cancer or fat necrosis. So if you don't have a good reason for her to have fat necrosis, then you might likely be looking at breast cancer and you should be recommending a biopsy. Of course, there are a few other things that can also have an echogenic halo, but in general, echogenic halos are a suspicious sign. Okay, let's talk about internal echo pattern. This is, again, I think pretty simple stuff. Of course, you can have um, an internal echo pattern that is anechoic, so completely, completely black, right? And cysts are classic for having an anechoic um, echogenicity. Of course, you have to have some other features associated with it to categorize it as a BIRADS2 benign, because not all anechoic masses are cysts. So again, you have to look at those margins, and you'll see that that mass on the bottom of your screen has much, um, or I should say, those margins are not circumscribed. They're more indistinct. Um, and that, of course, was breast cancer, although it was anechoic. Okay, so many masses in the breast are hypoechoic, though. Most masses, in fact, in the breast are hypoechoic. So it doesn't really help you um, in determining suspicious or benign just to have a hypoechoic mass. Again, you're going to look at other features, mainly the margins, the orientation, and the shape. So this is a fibroadenoma, and this is another invasive breast cancer, both of which are hypoechoic. All right, you can sometimes have masses that are isoechoic, which means that they are the same echogenicity as the surrounding fat. Um, you can imagine these are difficult to find because they are the same echogenicity as the surrounding fat, so they don't stand out very well. But if you do find them, they are typically benign. Most um, echo, isoechoic masses are in fact benign. However, again, not all. So the one on top is a nice fibroadenoma with sharp circumscribed margins and an oval shape. But the one on the bottom is mucinous carcinoma. And mucinous carcinomas can often actually be isoechoic masses. But again, if you look at those margins, you'll notice that they're not completely sharp. There's a couple little tails, a couple little irregularities, and that is what's gonna push you to make sure you biopsy that mass to prove what it is. Okay, masses can be hyperechoic. Um, a hyperechoic mass is typically benign. Lipomas, and again, fat necrosis, often um, are hyperechoic. And if you have yourself a uniformly circumscribed hyperechoic mass, um, that almost certainly is a BIRADS2 lipoma sort of thing. Sometimes fat necrosis, again, but you should have a history to um, support the diagnosis of fat necrosis. All right. One thing I do want to bring up also in the breast, it's this specific to breast ultrasound, is this concept of a complex cystic and solid mass, sometimes referred to just as a complex cystic mass. 
This means that whatever you're looking at appears to have um, both solid and cystic components to it. So some of it is anechoic and some of it is either iso or hypoechoic. Um, this is not, this is different from a complicated cyst and that's important to recognize. A complex cyst is not the same thing as a complicated cyst in the breast. Two very different things. A complex cyst has solid and cystic components to it. Sometimes it looks like there's a mural nodule um, and this needs to be biopsied. Um, papillary lesions um, are the most common type of mass to masquerade as a complex cystic mass in the breast. And that can include benign papillomas, atypical papillomas, and papillary carcinoma in situ. But invasive ductal carcinoma can also um, be a complex cystic mass. Um, when you biopsy this, you must biopsy the solid component. Draining the fluid and sending that off is not going to get you the diagnosis, so don't do that. You need to aim for that solid component and get a good core of it. All right, posterior acoustic features. Um, this, of course, refers to the attenuation characteristics of the mass. It's not very helpful, all right, but it does, or it's not very helpful for solid masses, but it is obviously very helpful in one of the criteria we use in order to determine something is a cyst. So um, here we see an anechoic mass. It has smooth margins, a couple of gentle lobulations, but really nice through transmission. Um, and that was a simple cyst. Sometimes you will see um, posterior acoustic shadowing, which this is a dense column of shadowing. I shouldn't use the word dense, sorry. A black column of shadowing um, posterior to the mass. This is a suspicious feature commonly associated with invasive ductal carcinoma, but not always. Um, anything that is dense, quote unquote, um, will, dense as in very packed with cells, will produce shadowing on ultrasound. So cancer is one of the things that can do this, but so can fibrosis and scars and diabetic mastopathy is sort of um, notorious for producing shadowing. Some fibroadenomas will also produce shadowing. All of that being said, typically when you see shadowing associated with a mass, um, that increases your level of suspicion to warrant a biopsy. Okay, some masses can have edge shadowing. This has no significance to it and often is seen actually in benign simple cysts. So don't let this fool you. Don't let, you, don't let this fool you into being a suspicious feature. It is not. Sometimes masses will have no posterior acoustic features to it. And this is commonly seen in isoechoic masses, which, uh, which I've told you already are typically benign. So having no posterior acoustic features can actually sometimes be a reassuring feature. All right. Okay, so that is it for masses. And again, I will say that that is sort of the, the meat of breast ultrasound because that is the, um, masses are the most common thing that we assess and describe and diagnose with breast ultrasound. So, very different from calcifications. Um, calcifications are not well characterized by ultrasound at all. And so you should not, you should not, you should not use ultrasound to characterize calcifications. Calcifications are best characterized on magnification mammographic views, okay? So if you've got yourself a mammogram showing calcifications and there's no hint of an associated mass, you should not do an ultrasound. You should only do an ultrasound if there is um, mammographic findings to suggest an associated mass. So that being said, you can sometimes see calcifications on ultrasound, which is fun, I guess. But again, here you can see that it's typically in association with a hypoechoic mass. You see these little echogenic foci that can quote unquote flicker in real time. So calcifications, while they can be seen by ultrasound, um, it is not the way to characterize calcifications. Again, magnification mammographic views are the ways to characterize calcifications. Okay, moving on to something that BIRADS calls special cases. Special cases in the BIRADS ultrasound um, portion of the BIRADS manual are things that have a quote unquote pathognomonic appearance. And there's quite a bit of them according to BIRADS. So we'll go through each of these pretty quickly also. We've talked about cysts a couple times so far. Cysts in the breasts are considered benign, right? BIRADS too, but they should meet, they, you should have very, very strict criteria. So they should be circumscribed, they should be round or oval, anechoic, and have posterior acoustic enhancement. 
So this is the one situation in which a round mass can be ignored, but it must be circumscribed anechoic and have posterior acoustic enhancement as well. And then you can call it a, um, a simple cyst, benign. Clustered microcysts um, have a sort of pathognomonic appearance on breast ultrasound as well. It can take a little time uh, to become familiar with what clustered microcysts look like on ultrasound. They're little tiny anechoic masses all grouped together with intervening septa. Um, if you feel comfortable that that is a cluster of microcysts and you are confident that, that is a cluster of microcysts, you can absolutely characterize that as a birads too. However, um, until you get to that comfort level, which again, I think takes some time and experience, you should be classifying these as a BIREDS 3 and doing a six month follow up. Complicated cysts, I talked about this briefly earlier, different from a complex cyst. A complicated cyst cannot typically be distinguished from a solid mass on ultrasound. It is a mass with homogeneous low level internal echoes. Okay, your gut or something about it tells you that you think it's a cyst, but you can't be sure of that because it's not anechoic and it doesn't have nice through transmission. Complicated cysts um, typically are put into a BIRADS 3 category and followed, or sometimes put into a BIRADS 4A category and aspirated slash biopsied. Masses in the skin, uh, most commonly epidermal occlusion cysts. Um, are a BIRADS2 finding. What you wanna look for is that A, the mass is completely located within the skin, so you see a claw sign coming out, the skin coming around that mass um, posteriorly. And if you can demonstrate a pore to the skin surface, then you've got yourself a BIRADS2 epidermal inclusion cyst and can reassure the patient that she's fine. Sometimes you'll see foreign bodies on ultrasound. Um, here you see an echogenic focus within a mass that was already biopsied, that's a biopsy clip. Um, you can see evidence of silicone implant rupture, which you already received a very nice talk about earlier. Um, this is snowstorm, dirty shadowing, implant rupture, extracapsular silicone implant rupture. Um, the stepladder sign is a sign of intracapsular silicone implant rupture and you just see multiple parallel lines within the implant itself. Okay, intramammary and axillary lymph nodes. Um, what you're looking for is that nice preserved fatty hilum and a very thin cortex in order to call that likely benign. Um, you will see post-surgical fluid collections. They don't always look pretty, and in fact, they often look kind of weird, but if you have a history of surgery and you know that she's gotten clear margins and she has a new mass, uh, more than likely it is a post-surgical seroma. Typically we don't do anything with these if we know for sure it's a post-surgical seroma based on history. We will aspirate them, however, if they um, are showing signs of infection. Sometimes they can qu get quite big and just be bothersome to the patient, in which case we will aspirate them also for symptomatic relief. All right, fat necrosis can have a very variable appearance both on mammography and on ultrasound, but typically fat necrosis has this echogenic rind that I talked about earlier, okay? Fat necrosis tends to be superficial because that's where fat necrosis occurs and hematomas occur in the breast. And you would like to know that the patient has a history of trauma and or is on blood thinners before categorizing this as a BIRADS3 lesion. If you have that sort of history and you see something like this with an echogenic rind or sort of you know, nice um, smooth margins and uniformly hyperechoic, you can put this in a BIRADS3 category. However, if you have no history of trauma, then you should probably put both of these types of lesions in a BIRADS4 category and biopsy them to prove that they are in fact benign. All right, associated features are things that you will see that your referring colleagues probably won't because your eye has been well trained by doing a radiology residency. So architectural distortion is something that you can see on ultrasound as well as mammography. Here, especially this mass um, on the lower half of your screen, you can see how these lines of tissue are coming up to that mass and being interrupted. That is the sonographic um, correlate, if you will, of architectural distortion. Obviously a worrisome feature, a suspicious feature. Sometimes you can see cystic dilatation of ducts. You can see um, you know, echogenic material within the duct, and sometimes you cannot tell if that's an interductal mass or just debris, and you may need to biopsy that to prove that it is benign. 
skin changes. Typically the breast skin, uh, the skin of the breast is about two millimeters. If it's greater than that, then um, you're looking at skin thickening, which can be, you know, focal or diffuse. And of course, you're going to have to place this in the clinical history in order to know if it's significant or not. Edema is typically characterized by fluid intervening within the tissue planes. And often you will see this in association with mastitis, inflammatory breast cancer. And vascularity, this is nonspecific, but can be helpful if you have a mass um, and don't forget to put color on it from time to time to see if you can show, see if there's internal vascularity. The absence of internal vascularity doesn't really help you, but once you've proven that something has internal vascularity, you know you are looking at a solid mass and therefore it typically means you should biopsy it. It can also help you to know where to biopsy and where not to biopsy. Of course, we would like to avoid blood vessels with our needles and not cause a big hematoma. Sometimes it helps you to distinguish if something is an intramammary lymph node if you can see the feeding blood vessel. All right, we're gonna move on to management algorithms. And the one that I wanna talk about basically is the BIRADS-3 management algorithm. Um, with regard to ultrasound findings. So typically, if you're gonna place something into a BIRES-3 category, you will do a follow-up ultrasound at six months, 12 months, and again at 24 months. Some institutions, some radiologists like to go out to 36 months, and that's just fine. Um, if you use one of these protocols, then that means the patient typically is coming back only for one additional study at the six month mark because the other ones fall at the time of her annual exam, at least if she's over the age of 40. So these are examples of a BIRADS-3 mass on ultrasound. A BIRADS-3 mass on ultrasound, and you should use very strict criteria for this, should be circumscribed, oval, and parallel to the skin surface. There should not be any suspicious features whatsoever of a mass on ultrasound to put it into a BIRADS-3 category. Um, they can be palpable. It's okay to put palpable masses that look like the ones I just showed you into a BIRADS-3 category, as long as there's no imaging um, evidence that it is new. Once you have a new mass, <clears throat> then you need to biopsy it. Um, you cannot put something new into a BIRADS-3 category. As you begin to follow it, if it increases in size, and some studies will say if it increases in a diameter of greater than 20%, then you need to move it into a BIRADS-4 category and do a biopsy. You're no longer in BIRADS-3 world if something grows. All right, you can also place um, things that you believe to be complicated cysts and clusters of microcysts and hyperechoic masses, like I showed you earlier, safely into a BIRADS-3 category. Sometimes women will come with palpable lumps that you believe to be just a fat lobule. That's safely BIRADS-3. And then sometimes you will do ultrasounds in women who have had surgery um, and you know or you think at least what you're looking at or it's this post-surgical scar. That also can be put into a BIRADS-3 category, but you have to tread lightly with that one. That one's a little bit more dangerous and you have to have a very high level of comfort that what you're looking at is in fact just scar tissue. All right, let's talk about clinical uses of breast ultrasound. By far, far and large, we use breast ultrasound strict, mainly for diagnostic purposes. Um, of course, we use it to characterize solid versus cystic, but hopefully I've shown you in this talk that you also can use it to establish a level of suspicion. We typically use it just for focal areas of concern, not for diffuse areas of concern. Things that are diffuse in the breast, we, we rely more on mammography to look at but focal areas of concern, we typically will involve breast ultrasound. Certainly breast ultrasound can help facilitate a core biopsy. And again, we use it to establish rad path correlation. I'm gonna talk briefly about screening with breast ultrasound. So, you know, mammography always has controversy, it seems like associated with it. And in 2012, the whole idea of breast density sort of hit the lay papers. And that is what has led to uh, more and more screening ultrasound in women who are at normal risk for developing breast cancer. So breast density, of course, is the relative amount of fibrous glandular tissue. Um, it is something that is seen on a mammogram, right? This is a mammographic finding. This is not a physical exam finding. Um, and there's a wide spectrum of how women look on mammography and what their breast densities are. 
breast density is measured as an approximation. It's pretty much a gestalt by the interpreting radiologist. Um, there's no real gold standard for how to measure breast density. And many studies have shown that the reproducibility of breast density is relatively poor. The same radiologist will categorize the same woman differently from year to year, and the same woman will be categorized differently depending on which radiologist is looking at her study. But it is important because it impacts the detection of breast cancer. On mammography, we know that women who are more dense are less, um, or what I should say is mammography is less sensitive in women who are more dense on mammography. And it is quoted as an independent risk factor for developing breast cancer. Um, you all know the ways that breast cancer looks on um, um, mammography. And every single one of these ways that it appears will be white on a mammogram. So of course, the more dense she is and the more white she is on the mammogram, the harder those things are to see. And so in this woman, seeing the new five millimeter breast cancer will be much harder than finding the new five millimeter breast cancer that might develop in this woman. Um, as you all probably know, breast density legislation mandates that every um, letter that we give to women um, describes their breast density, um, says that it does in fact have an effect on the presence of um, finding breast cancer on a mammogram. Um, we have to make sure that we tell women what their breast density is and then provide um, uh, guidance in terms of additional screening tools if they are considered dense on mammography. Uh, this was all started by a grassroots campaign and a woman who was diagnosed with stage for breast cancer uh, six weeks after she had a normal screening mammogram. And she realized that it was because she was very dense on mammography and mammography really probably wasn't doing, doing her justice, if you will. So all states mandate that we give women letters um, saying what their results are on their mammogram and including information about their breast density. The problem with that is that not all insurance companies will always cover screening ultrasound in women with dense breasts. And so um, when they show up to your clinic for screening ultrasound, it is important to make sure that they understand that they might not um, have insurance coverage to pay for that breast ultrasound. Um, certainly ultrasound is easier, less expensive, and more comfortable for the patients compared to MRI in terms of a supplemental screening test. Um, there have been no randomized control trials showing a mortality benefit, though, when you use whole breast ultrasound. Um, tomosynthesis is certainly helping. Tomosynthesis has a better cancer detection rate over 2D mammography. It also has a reduced recall rate over 2D mammography, and that is across all age groups and breast densities. These are two graphs showing that tomosynthesis compared to 2D mammography has a reduced recall rate and an improved cancer detection rate, no matter the breast density. Um, and screening breast ultrasound typically is um, used, most of the studies that we have with regard to screening breast ultrasound were done in women who were at high risk. And those studies definitely showed that adding screening ultrasound to a screening mammogram caught more breast cancers, but it came at the price of false positive exams. So it's always a balancing act trying to figure out what, um, what is, what's, what's more worth it, I guess, finding more breast cancers or decreasing your false positive rate. Certainly, we know that MRI is better than screening ultrasound for finding additional cancers. And um, if your patient is high risk for developing breast cancer, we prefer to use breast MRI um, with mammography as opposed to screening ultrasound. Okay, so in conclusion, um, again, I encourage you to learn the BIRAS terminology and use it appropriately when describing masses on ultrasound. It will help you and your patients. Margin and orientation are probably two of the most important, most critical features to assess on breast ultrasound. Um, and screening ultrasound will certainly detect additional cancers. It will also provoke false positive rates though and perhaps unnecessary biopsies. And just something to keep in mind in your women who are at normal risk uh, coming in for screening breast ultrasound. All right, so hopefully that'll help you look at all these masses a little bit more carefully and know exactly how you're gonna manage them. Thank you very much for your attention.